Today, I'm Jakku Deacon from FETSAS. FETSAS is the national representative organization which guides, trains, and advises school governing bodies on all matters pertaining to the management and governance of schools in South Africa. We have a large footprint in South Africa with capable professional managers in all nine provinces. Our national offices are in Bloemfontein, where our support staff fulfill valuable operational, legal and logistical functions to our provincial managers. At FITSAS, we believe that people do what they do for our schools because they love the schools and they love their children. And we do what we do because we love our schools, our children and our country. We acknowledge that our governors are busy active people, often involved in busy, time-stressed lives, with precious little time available to spend on time-consuming activities like traveling to and from training opportunities or attending lengthy meetings. You are, after all, volunteers, offering your valuable time, expertise and commitment to improve our education system. We understand that you cannot always attend conventional training sessions. However, training and information is key to the success of our schools. And we also understand the importance of continual development in an ever-changing, vibrant, people-focused environment. To this concern, we are offering these online webinar sessions which will bring vital, pertinent information right to you at your workplace or home with less time and money spent out of your day job environment. These sessions are short and sharp and are designed to complement our current endeavors in furthering school management and governance. They are designed as an additional tool to our regular interactions and they will not replace our existing structures or our provincial managers in the provinces. Indeed, from each section, you may have specific questions that you wish to ask your provincial manager about with regards to details, process and specific challenges that you and your school may face. These interactive sessions will also allow you to get a better understanding of best practice through expert advice. We will be covering a range of topics of school governance and management, so be sure to attend those in future. Please do pass the value and importance of these sessions to your fellow governors and fellow schools. Enjoy the sessions and please provide feedback to us to improve our delivery of this service. Enjoy it. This session will be presented by Rial van der Berg, our National Technology Manager in FETSAS. Enjoy his company. Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Paul Rankin. I'm from FETSAS. Um, I'm based in KZN. Just got to do a bit of a time check, um, three o'clock, and I've got to do a language check just after three o'clock and on this uh, two minute a lot. Um, uh, welcome to everybody to the session today. Um, today we have Rian Frannenberg who's going to take us through a very interesting topic and I think something that we need to start concentrating on a little bit more as to what is the normal and where are we sitting with the processes today. So yeah, welcome. I see there are a few people that are still coming in on board, but as is our habits, three o'clock we normally get started. Um, I'm just roughly going to go through some details so we can just pick up for those of you that might not be aware of how the processes operate. Um, we throughout the country, based in a number of different places. Rian sitting in Gauteng, and today we're discussing normalizing the abnormal. Um, I really think a, a really topical subject, something that we need to get to grips with a little bit more and in more detail. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Rian. Um, let's just go back to our full share first so we can see where everybody is. And I'm just going to check. I think Rian's picked up most of the questions. I'll hand over to Rian, and if there are any questions that I need to pick up, Looks like Rian's picked up most of them from that side. Yeah, thanks very much, Rian. Thanks for handling that, and I'll hand over straight to you. Yeah, good afternoon, goeiemiddag. I think we're slightly a mixed, mixed language uh, group because we condensed two sessions into one, so I'm not 100% sure. But I think we're going to rock and roll in English today since we, since we have a mixed bag there. I hope you can uh, see me and hear me well. I was at the dentist about an hour and a half ago and the thick lip has not subsided yet. So if I sound a little bit under the weather, it's not under the whiskey. Uh, I'm 100% uh, sober. later <laughs> <laughs> um, So yeah, happiness. Let's jump straight into it. Um, 
I think technology is, is, is something that is slightly mystified sometimes. I had a chat with someone at a conference uh, on Thursday and said, it's sad that we have a conference on education and then there's a separate room for technology where a few people go and talk how technology and education technology can change schooling as if there should have been a room uh, 300 years ago to say, there's the paper room. Now we talk paper and now we talk, well, then we talk paper and now we talk um, digital as if technology is about the tools and not the use of the tools of our time. And uh, last year I, I was at a conference where a lady from England spoke and she said the following words, we have to learn, and I put uh, in brackets added it, and teach as we live. Because we, we're living in a normalized life outside of our schooling environment. Everything we do is just normal because that's the de facto standard. We drive the cars we do, we watch the TV screens we do, we visit the places we do, we use the cash or not, which we do. Um, and that has become normal without us thinking. Yet the schooling environment has not adapted to that normalized position. So sometimes we mystify this thing. We've got to talk about technology. Okay, send someone separately that knows a little bit about it. Send the youngest people with their own iPads and they know what technology is. And, and let's just do something about technology instead of just thinking how our lives have changed already and how it's permeated in our regular day-to-day -day life. So what we're going to do as, as quick as possible today, <laughs> I've got quite a few slides, is uh, just looking at how the world has changed. Um, and that's a little bit about the discussion on the intro. How the world is changing, and they will reference just one slide that says everyone is talking about something called the fourth industrial revolution. How we are not changing, and that is looking inwards to who like on school know. What do ons by on school? What are other people doing at their school? And it still looks very much the same. I had a parent talk uh, somewhere the other day that said she did a research study at school and found that in 2019, schools looked very similar to when she was at school in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. I'm like, is that possible? And then last step, we want to give you some advice and hopefully point you in the right direction to say, how can we respond? I don't have a list. Uh, strategic plan, a 10 bullet uh, agenda for you. But I think what I wanna to get to is, if you can hear my heart, uh, if we want to do different, we've gotta think different. And maybe we should just start changing our thinking a little bit. So uh, a big portion of today is how to respond in changing our thought processes so that the actions that follow from that becomes a little bit more automatic. So looking at how the world has changed, I've got some um, newspaper uh, clippings there, uh, some just artwork, TV guide. I don't know how many of you remember that. There's the iPod on a little stand. Uh, my kids are eight and nine. They don't know what an iPod is. It's too old for them. And then obviously the pull down menu if someone answers to you. So, so in a very interactive session, it'd be nice to just raise the hands and say, how do we obtain and consume information these days? In most face-to-face uh, -face sessions, a lot of people would lift up their cell phones and say, but that's how I get the information that I want. I don't buy the newspaper anymore because by the time I buy it, drive home and open it, there's new news that's the, not, the, 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 the newest story on the front page. Um, we watch the TV, yes, but there's 24 hours of news. It's not six o'clock. We have News24, Netwerk 24, CNN, whatever it is that we've got on our phones and it's an app and we get the news by push information. So. So we consume information mainly behind glass and what we want in the short snippets that we want to consume it. So think about how that has changed for you from 20 years ago when you had the newspaper delivered to your front door and you only read this morning what happened yesterday. You didn't have it before. How do we engage with others? Oh my goodness. Uh, who wants to leave the WhatsApp group, especially if it's your um, in-laws family uh, uh, group that and there's just a few groups that you don't want to join but we now talk more to each other by means of text than by means of voice so we engage via whatsapp via facebook uh, which is for old people to talk to the kids instagram which is picturesque not words snapchat the whole bang shoots i mean we had problems with bbm 10 years ago now we've got so many platforms so we engage with others differently who listens to music by buying the CD. 
My kids don't know what a CD is. Like I said, my kids don't know what an iPod is. We rent music. We don't buy music. iTunes has this rental scheme, 60 bucks a month. You get all the, the music that you want. You fix your own playlist and you get the music. So there's fundamentals in changing of owning, following the band or making your own playlist. So there's a lot more personalization and temporary use in, in things. I know that uh, vinyl is uh, very much a hot uh, collector's uh, movement at the moment. And a lot of people are returning to vinyl LPs, long play albums. How do we consume, consume entertainment? This was very funny when I, when I read this. I see, uh, you all see the TV Guide. I remember growing up and we had the TV Guide magazine every Sunday in the Sunday newspaper. And you had to circle what you wanted to watch because it was only on then, on that day, on that channel. So you moved your schedule around what the TV said. Nowadays, it's slightly different. Um, now, we consume TV with playlists, box office, Showmax, Netflix, PVR, catch up, I can't remember all the names now. We even freeze and pause, uh, rewind live TV. So it's, it's very good for marriage counseling. If, if your wife calls you and it's in the middle of the, the final move in the World Cup, you can pause it and say, Come, Scott, can you help him help? And then you return to the live game. But we, we, we've got all this power. Um, PricewaterhouseCoopers released a consumer behavior report not long ago but three, four weeks ago, where they said very interesting stats. They, they surveyed, I don't know, all countries in the world, uh, looked at about 1,000 South Africans from all provinces, from all walks of life, from all demographics. Uh, access to uh, devices and internet was, was kind of a telling thing. But what really amazed me was the fact that 23% of South Africans, uh, which they surveyed, so they say it's representative, watch a movie on a mobile device daily and only 25 percent listen to music on a mobile device daily so i would have thought that that gap would have been bigger but we consume entertainment unscheduled mobile on the device that we want so interesting and, I, and i'm sure if i could see the whole crowd now everyone would nod their heads and say yes this is how the world has changed for me without even thinking let's look at some further elements we look at all the um, top left corner, all our fitness devices. I just took off mine because it's my watch uh, as well. But I share a stack of data daily to my medical aid, how many steps I took, what the hours were that I slept, my resting heart rate, when I train, what my heart rate is. We are tracking ourselves in a big way. Your watch is more than just the time. Uh, how we book flights for vacation. Everyone goes to Kalula, Travel Start, Expedia. I mean, you hardly go into a travel agency anymore because you have the power by going online. Um, how we shop. My goodness, uh, I must admit that I'm not big on shopping in the real world, but also not in the virtual world. But the other day, I bought something on Take A Lot. Got a 150 Rand gift voucher. And instead of them delivering it to me, I thought of going to their pickup center on the N1 highway just north of um, Joburg. And it's amazing. You walk in there, you've got a QR code, they punch it in or they scan it. And the next thing, a conveyor belt brings it from the middle of the highway somewhere in a bridge and it drops off in a conveyor belt to your uh, kiosk counter there. Uh, they say that there are kids born already that will never need to go to a mall or to a shop because everything will be delivered and in some cases be delivered not by means of people but by means of drones and, and other artificial intelligence. So how we shop has changed. Um, I'm sure that everyone is shopping online for something. Uh, I mean, if we go back to that, we can also say that the, the invent of the credit card or SnapScan, Zapper, um, that is also stuff that has changed, radically changed the way we work. Uh, and a lot of stuff is happening behind the scenes. That's how banks, you go to the one ATM, withdraw money, but your bank knows it immediately. And it's, it's just the way things in the world has changed. I've mentioned fitness. I've mentioned sports data and statistics. You see on the rugby field, on the soccer field, halfway through the game, they tell you how many guys have, ran, have run how many meters, have made so many tackles, their average heart rate. I mean, if you watch the Giro d'Italia or the Tour de France, they tell you what wattage the guys pedal at. So there's a lot of data online immediately available. Not to talk about our cars, Bluetooth radios, um, smart TVs, 
So things have changed rapidly in our world and we're not denying that and we're not resisting that. It says if we fit into that without thinking because that just made our lives more productive. Nowadays at home would have three, four TV screens. Uh, you would have Wi-Fi. You would have multiple devices. The hand-me-down cell phones stay in the drawer because the kids can play with it later. and they kind of, So we are far more enriched in that sense. So if we look at then and now, I think there's something, especially looking at TV, uh, entertainment, uh, how we consume movies, what we do by ourselves, is what has changed, when has it changed, not when has it changed, but when do we apply it, and where do we apply it. So there's a big change from mass and group, the news at six, to personalized. I recorded and I watched it after I put my kids to bed. Scheduled. Um, same thing. It was at six. Everyone had to watch it. That was, it was mass and it's scheduled. Now, I watch what I want. I don't watch the same news you do. I don't watch the same series you do. And I watch it when I am ready. That's what Netflix and Showmax and Catch Up and all these things teach us. So we're moving away from everything in mass and group to things being far more personalized. You look in the um, bus, in the train, anywhere you go, people are staring at their own screens. Scheduled, when the bell rings, no, it's not when the bell rings. And localized, it was only in one space. Um, your TV was in your house, the movie was at the movies, the event was somewhere at the event, you had to go there. Now you find it on mobile, everything is mobile. So there is a big fundamental shift from then to now with these three things becoming personalized, unscheduled and mobile versus mass scheduled and localized. And hopefully by now, a chord has struck, the clock is gelei, the penny is gedropped, Something happened to say, but that is more or less what's still happening in school. So how the world is changing, I referenced that earlier, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this. All learners enrolled today are citizens of the 21st century. The matrix of last year were 2000 babies. Uh, so the matrix of this year would be 2001. The grade 12s uh, are 21 babies. The grade 1s will finish school in 2030. The grade 1s, no, let's say it this way. We are already teaching the class of 2030. And I wish I could get some uh, questions from the audience now because if I had to ask you now, think back how old you think the iPad as a device is. Uh, I usually get the answer between 2003 to 2007. It is a 2010 device, probably got popular in South Africa 2011. It's an eight year old device and it's probably close to being old news in some circles at home in real life. People have taken it up and then put it down again. And we're already teaching the class of 2030, how is life going to change in the next 11 years for those kids that are gonna start studying or into the workplace after 2030? So it's very interesting. Someone said the other day, the average person born today will live to see the 22nd century, how frightening is that? But we're already engaging with people um, that will see the turn of the next century, pretty frightening. The three things that uh, is happening as, as far as how the world is changing and progressively changing and people talking about it is the fourth industrial revolution and the fourth industrial revolution in education. Every speech, the president, Sona speech, the minister talks, Everywhere you go, there's this big thing. The fourth industrial revolution has got to save us in the country or save education. Now, I'm like two steps back. I don't even think we've had the second and third industrial revolution take over education completely. And there's some merit in saying that some of the elements can really advance and jump the big divides that we have. If connectivity is sorted out, every child can have access to the most amazing lessons, teachers, information online. But if you don't have the devices and connectivity, then the divide is just going all the way bigger. So we want to use the term 21st century education rather than technology and rather than the fourth industrial revolution, which a lot of people are still not 100% sure where they fit in into that. I've got some, some details on that. They, they define it as a cyber, cyber physical systems where, where man and machine connect to each other. Um, 
and and in a small sense that's where our heart rate monitors and our uh, wristband devices are already we're sharing data while living without filling out a form or without going for a checkup we're just sending this data to the world whilst driving if you've got a discovery insurance uh, drive uh, scenario in your car while you drive they know how fast you're turning how sharp you're braking how abrupt you're uh, pulling away and these kind of things so there's systems and people getting closer to each other um, the key disruptors in this arena and I want to focus on one or two of them the first one is technology is everywhere we cannot deny it doesn't mean that we have to just uh, absorb it everywhere but it, it is everywhere we don't even know but we talk about wireless but we've had been having it we had wire uh no we, we now talk wi-fi we when i grew up my grandparents spoke about wireless so it's there there's waves going on and we're sharing data but technology is everywhere one of the big issues is that of the tsunami of data i think we're misreading the value of data in education but data is why facebook google Instagram, all these platforms are number one for free and number two so valuable. Why is something for free so valuable? It's because they know everything. So um, data is something that we've got to start focusing on. And then uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, that's coming to the fore. How jobs will change. Uh, everyone knows uh, that the, 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 the key skills required is changing as we speak. So this is what the World Economic Forum is putting to the front uh, of our minds saying the top 10 skills required in 2020, uh, that's not far away, that's just around the corner, as compared to 2015, where uh, that's also not too long ago, that's uh, just mere three and a half, four years ago. Complex problem solving, still top of the list. Critical thinking moved up quite a few spots. Creativity moved from 10 to three. People management, still in top uh, echelon. Coordinating with others, emotion intelligence, judgment and decision making. Now, these are not subjects that we have at school, uh, but these are the skills that we need. <laughs> uh, yet, it's fast changing. And there's a list, uh, you, you Google this, you, you find a, a vast array of opinions on what the skills are that is needed. But the point is, the world is constantly changing and we've got to get ready for the change. Uh, impact of the, disrupt, the, the disruptors that I mentioned earlier, 10 skills for the future workforce, sense making, novel and adaptive thinking, computational thinking, transdisciplinarity, uh, so it's like interdisciplinarity, cognitive load management, cross-cultural competence, how relevant is that in our country, design mindset, a complete new field of study in this design mindset. So, so I'm just putting a few things out there and, and we don't have time to, to delve into it and maybe we can take some discussion questions on that a little bit later on. So that is how the world has changed. We can't deny how we just fit into it without even thinking. It has become normal without training. How the world is changing, that's a little bit scary. Now let's look at how we are not changing and this is not my opinion, uh, this is some sort of research and then visiting a couple of hundred schools uh, a year over the past few years, some of them in bigger workshop groups and some of them one-on-one. -on -one. And this is what we see at schools. Um, there's a school in 1890, a uh, sad picture. The uh, kids don't have teeth and they don't have arms, it looks like. They definitely don't have hands. I must think that they'll be sitting on their hands in this class. Let's look at a school in 1990. Oh, vastly different. The kids got arms and the kids got smiles. But the rows still look the same. The class essentially still looks the same. And yeah, makes one wonder. If we talk about technology and uh, the impact it could have, I'm saying the world has changed. Technology hasn't changed the world. And I hope we don't think of just doing this and giving a few kids a few devices and calling ourselves entrenched in the era that we live in. I don't want to call it e-learning. I don't want to call it a tech-based school. I don't want to call it um, technology in one classroom. I want to say that we've got to get to a place that we just fit into the world outside of school in the same way we fit into the world inside of school. And these worlds look the same. 
Uh, by the time the overhead projector came uh, uh, into schools in the 18, uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, 1960s, and that was many years after it was uh, developed or, or designed, the overhead projector is probably a 1930-odd uh, model. But when it became popular in schools in the 50s and 60s, in South Africa, there was no electricity in a lot of places. There was no TV anywhere. Um, movies weren't something you did every day. Nowadays, we are so enriched outside, and yet we have not led the way in schools. We are struggling to follow with, with the use of technology in this. Okay, so the fundamentals of school then, um, just looking at, at what's been like this and what's still not changing is, number one, we've got single grade groups, single grade classes, and there's merit in that. Uh, we've got single subject lectures and tests, talking about interdisciplinarity, hey? We do maths and we do maths. We don't introduce robotics in maths because maths is maths. Uh, we don't do computer programming in math because math is math. Uh, you can only do bigger than and smaller than in math, but you can actually do it using some uh, computer programming. And the test, we don't, we don't integrate. One teacher, one classroom. Oh, I've seen this many times and I hope I'm not stepping on any feet now. Forgive me as I go on a few feet, but a teacher's classroom is his little holy domain. Um, we can't not teach in our classroom. It is very localized. I struggle to teach in a neighbor's classroom because my blackboard is not in the same spot. My, there's, there's a fundamental that it is only for me, for my subject, and for my kids coming to me. Uh, a lot of schools have moved into this roaming teacher and sharing, sharing resources. But um, we're looking at a lot of attendance. We still give attendance, uh, and it's a good thing to, to attend. I'm not saying because if you're not there, you can't learn. But you could be there and not learn, which is the biggest fear. Versus contribution or connection. The work is very scheduled. The day is scheduled. It's the only place in life where we still have a lot of clocks going on. Um, and I don't know what the alternative is, but maybe we should start thinking about the way we watch TV, six o'clock, us, us, or the news. Now we do it anytime, anywhere, any place, but clock driven. It's the same schedule and it's the same for everyone. My kid is a morning kid, your kid is an afternoon kid, but they've got to go to math or the difficult science subjects at the same time. Knowledge transfer, we teach versus curiosity learning. We ask questions and get them to get the answers because nowadays if you sit in a in a, any group setup and someone says, hey, who did that? And someone says, no, 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 I'll quickly check. Um, it was 1954 and it was Albert Einstein. And it's like, okay, we know. Um, nothing is unknown anymore. So we find out by asking questions, not by reciting so. Traditional extramurals. We look at schools in the same ways as we do. Um, it's the, uh, in my subculture, uh, uh, hockey, rugby, cricket, netball, choir, um, debate, uh, chess. These things have been there for, for many, many years. And I'm not saying that they are not valid, but I'm saying what additional activities do we start thinking about? Arts, um, uh, computer coding, 3D printing, drone flying, um, Problem solving, uh, collaborating with people in other countries because now the world is a small voice, a small, small island, small village, the global village. Uh, so there's a lot of things we can add into our traditional extramurals. We teach to the test because we get evaluated to the test. So if people, the kids understand what we taught, we test them and they get good grades, we've done our job. But we're not 100% sure if they've internalized and fixed the problems. So yeah, there's a lot of fundamentals in school that can, can be debated. And to just bring it to a computer um, keyboard, you'll all know that the computer keyboard has the control button and the escape button. And I'm sometimes concerned who's controlling who and who wants to escape from where uh, if I look at the way the world has changed. Just a little tongue in cheek there. So we go back to what is fundamentals in school. We go back to what is fundamentals in the way we're living now. Um, yeah in all spheres of life. It's not just television. It's not just um, the way we watch movies. It's how we interact with the bank. I've got a personalized banking profile. Uh, there's a mass product, but I am personalizing it by setting up my beneficiaries on my internet banking account. Scheduled. 
Uh, it happens when they say it does, and who knows who that they are. I now choose when I say it does. I can watch the voice at 10 o'clock on a Sunday night after my kids have gone to bed, or I can watch it live because I don't want anyone on the WhatsApp group to spoil it for me. Um, localized. I don't have to be in front of my own computer to access my own email. I can be on mobile, on anyone's computer. I can share my, my uh, Google and Microsoft profile. Uh, whatever is in the cloud is available from anywhere. And we've all heard about the cloud. Okay, so the big question now is what can we do to respond? And as I said earlier, and I want to reiterate it again, if we can maybe just tickle the mind to say we've got to start thinking before we got to start doing. A lot of schools, a lot of SGBs want to get activities done. We want to budget it so we can do it so it's done and nothing has changed because we haven't given the thinking into it. So um, let's, let's maybe hope that we can think around these programs. And I'm, I'm happy for people to challenge my thinking. I've just set it out as, as I see it in research and as I see it in day-to-day in, uh, -day life. What can schools and SGBs do to respond to this massive wave of change um, by not thinking it's different? Uh, I love this little cartoon where it says, it dries the washing using the very latest technology. Latest, <laughs> a combination of solar and wind power. We give new words to old concepts and we think it's new and that makes it abnormal. So we're abnormalizing something that is for the select few, as if the battery didn't change our lives from 200 years ago and everything we do now. A cell phone works because it has a battery, but the battery is not new. <laughs> uh, the battery has been there before any of us. Enig iemand wat vandag na hierdie show kyk, hierdie webinars in, is gebore lang na die ontwikkeling van batterije. So it's not new, so don't mystify it, don't abnormalize it. Put the norm into the abnormal. The FEDSA Center for Technology is a, is a drive that we've you know, tried to, to launch um, over the last four years and it culminated into uh, our four years of digital citizenship, citizenship campaigns and road shows and, and knowledge sharing has culminated in the launch of the FEDSA Center for Technology October last year, where we're trying to create a space where we can, number one, define the new normal, and number two, give space for schools to talk about this world of new normal. If we look at these four icons, um, Twitter, Google+, Instagram, and Facebook, now they say TGIF, thank goodness it's Friday. No, it's Twitter, Google, Instagram, and Facebook. That's how our lives have become. And some of them are already old, uh, old school stuff. So we're trying to give information and, and guidance to school. In saying that, uh, we, we, we still want to entrench the past. We had the three R's of education. So many of us know them off by heart, and we know that two of them are not R's. But they read easily, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, we want to say that we should add a few R's to the 21st century skills list. And as you can see, I have not taken away the first three. We're adding, we're not um, deleting. Reading is very important. We believe that most people nowadays read more words on screen than on paper. I definitely do. You read emails daily, you send emails. So you write in email format. You read in website format. Arithmetic, uh, you still do in the same way in, in, in your mind, but reading is not uh debated at all we just got to think of how we sensibly use devices to encourage reading for pleasure for pleasure and doing more reading and finding reading problems writing married to an occupational therapist so so fine motor skills you don't have to tell me anything about that uh and it's important but somehow we know that we're all going to be typing for a big portion of the rest of our lives and no school is teaching typing. Yet, that is one of the number one skills that you're gonna be using for the rest of your life. But we're not preparing for that. The list that we're adding on is reasoning, critical thinking, problem solving, algorithms, another R, algorithms, is another word for coding, robotics, uh, computer programming is just a set of rules, algorithms, that make machines do something that you tell them to do. 
very important skill in this time of disconnection through the internet and, and devices is teaching relationships. Uh, with all the information that we have, respect and responsibility. If we respect someone, we won't diss them on a WhatsApp group. We will use information responsibly and not like some, um, uh, well, a very high profile politician in Gauteng last week uh, went to Twitter on fake news um, and we've all seen that happen. So we've got to be responsible in this time uh, with all the new information, uh, the vastness and the speed of it. So these are the skills that we need to be teaching. What can schools do, SGBs and school management, to take initiative? We feel that the department is going to respond slower to this than a school on its own tactically can do. We've got to go from talk to action, and I've circled action. I've got a big issue with schools not changing and still looking the same. We've got to start challenging ourselves uh, about what we do. And this is where I see a lot of schools making the mistake of being very successful and their success being their biggest drawback to change because what they are producing is very good, a good quality learner. But we're producing a learner for the 1980s and yet those kids are going to live in the, ninth, uh, in the 2030s. So yes, we're very good at chopping trees, but we must find the right forest. So we must teach in the time and the era of where we are and prepare kids for that. I say here, access without impact is mere availability. If we don't have impact with what we introduce in our schooling process, and that's where a lot of schools are making the mistake, they're buying a lot of products, hanging a lot of screens and projectors, but it's just making it nicer. But there's access to it, there's no impact, which means we've paid for a lot of availability. I wanna see us putting uh, a lot more emphasis on better learning outcomes when using the tools. Stop putting the fun in dysfunctional. It's as if there's a narrative of how dysfunctional the system is, how dysfunctional our budgets are, how dysfunctional the department is. And, and, and it's like, okay, well, we all know this, but we're not changing anything. So I would really urge you guys to, to think in a functional way, not in a dysfunctional way, and SGBs and school management teams can take the initiative for their own school. That's why the school is a touristic person, a local school run by the local people with local funding. Our roadmap for, roadmap for tech adoption uh, focuses on four big areas, and we've actually uh, got an A and a B on one of those. So it's actually five areas. But we say if you want to do something, you've got to sort out your infrastructure and connectivity. That's the big thing. The foundation has got to be sorted. A lot of schools are now getting high-speed internet. Uh, you've got to open it up, but then you've got to manage it. You've got to manage the teachers, their connectivity, their uh, behavior, what sites they go to. So you've got servers and firewalls and device management issues to take care of. But if you sorted that out, you can have access to information that is so vast and useful that it will have impact. The second one is that of digital administration or the office space and classroom administration. That's the uh, world of school administration and management systems, SAMs, which the government has their own SA SAMs, and then there's the third party arenas out there. It adds to pastel world, the, the finance world, the communication world, the D6 Connect or communicator app or whatever app you use to communicate with your parents. It introduces the thinking of Google Apps for Education or Microsoft Office 365, which is available in most provinces for free to schools. Seven of the nine provinces have a Microsoft agreement and all schools, including learners and um, educators, can have, can have access to Office 365 and many more. In fact, next week, Monday, we'll be running a Microsoft uh, educator community uh, webinar with the people from Microsoft. They're going to be presenting that, that uh, webinar. The third element is that of learning spaces. We call digital classrooms, I say digital learning spaces. And that's two elements. That's the one that we've given an A and a B. The first one is what we say learning or teaching with and through technology. That's enriching delivery, like we're doing now. I've got a PowerPoint slideshow, you can follow me. And that's generic content, but you just engage more. The second one is teaching new technology subject matter. And that's where I think we've got to go to our extramural, our extracurricular world of coding, robotics, 3D printing, design thinking, 
um, connecting with people in other worlds, following webcams of safaris online. I mean, the, the world is just endless, but how we enrich by teaching the world of technology. And then the last one is that of learner devices. And that's very debatable in primary school. I don't think the debate is really sorted out yet. But if we've got devices for learners, it could be either individual devices that they bring themselves. It could be lab devices that the school give. But what are they doing with it? Or it could be really much a replacement of all their um, textbooks uh, that they're not carrying around. One of our partners in, in the Center for Technology has a virtual library for free for all schools in the country. Snaplify's library for all schools. I, I can't believe that people are not reading more because they've got access to 46,000 books for free because it's just behind glass. You don't have to buy more books for your library. You don't have to build a bigger library. But I don't see kids reading anymore because they're in their screens. So make them read on their screens. I'm gonna stop here um, uh, and, and see how we're doing for time. Uh, just to, to see if there's some questions and some of the questions might end up to, to, to speak to the rest of the uh, slides that I have. But this is just putting those four cornerstones into uh, different words. The first one of connectivity, infrastructure, efficiency and productivity is your, your administration. Delivery is your, is your um, uh, learning spaces enrichment and consumption. And if I want to do it differently, I want to say it is... Uh, we got to we got to improve four E's if we want to change technology use in our schools. We got to change educators, so teach them with new technology. We got to change our education spaces with new technology. We got to change our behaviour of new technology uh, with educating through uh, new tech, with and through new tech, and then educating the new technology subject matter. So I've got two two quick models. That we've done so you can see we've got to address people we've got to address places we've got to address behavior and we've got to address address subject matter uh, in order for us to fit into this new world but i want to give us some good time to to take questions if there's no questions i'll i'll, I'll jump back to this quick uh and easy paul over to you if there are any questions at this point in time you can share your screen that's great yeah let me just see exactly where i am at the moment uh, da, 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 da. I think you're still sharing screens at the moment, Rian. Um, yeah, right. Francis. Stop sharing. Okay, let me go there. I, oh. I see your screen, so you must be sharing. Must be sharing. Let me just go through. Okay, excellent. There's just a, a comment here, which I think it's, well, there's a comment and a question. Um, Francois, thanks very much. Transitioning to a different way of teaching is easy adaptable to learners. Hence, they grow up with technology. How do we transition the teacher to teach in the fourth industrial revolution classroom? Before, before you answer that, Rian, I just had a thought, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a serving chairman on a governing body and I'd just like to share this with everybody that we, we've moved from printing reams and reams of agendas and minutes and bullets and everything. And when we get to our meeting, we project everything on the wall. We have the discussion. The minutes are typed up. Um, the minutes are then emailed to everybody as we have our last cup of coffee before we leave, hopefully at about eight o'clock. Um, and the minutes are gone out without many pieces of paper. I'm not saying no pieces of paper, but without many pieces of paper. And, and to me, the answer in that lies, if we start doing as governors, then educators can see that it's not such a big step. We aren't asking the impossible here. We're just starting to live the process. Um, yes, paper is printed every now and again, but we try and minimize that printing as much as possible. So, so that's just one way that we, and I'll use that as an example, um, that, that we can use that. I mean, I, I attended the, the um, School Business Management Association conference recently. Very little documentation was printed. It's all on links or emails and sent through to people. And, and that's the way we're living now. And we need to start moving in that direction as well. But I'll let you answer that question from Francois from your side, yeah? Yeah, I'm quickly looking for a document on my computer, which I don't find quickly, uh, but it's on the FETAS uh, technology website, uh, technology page on the FETAS website, technology play, page on download. There's a professional development framework for digital education that the Department of Education produced uh, recently. So uh, I just want to park that there. There's a document done with probably 10 years of, of, of uh, research and a lot of 
very relevant um, courses and skills that people need to acquire. So that's a framework done just as, as an insert. The second thing is CPTD. We all know that teachers have got to do 150 points worth of CPTD every three years in order for them to be still registered at SAIS. Now, SAIS doesn't have a lot of teeth, but I still think if we only teach kids to pass, uh, most teachers will tell you that's not what I'm doing. But the teachers only do enough points to have their teaching license. We've got to change our mindset and say we've got to get new skills, constant con for professional development. And if it's not a minimum requirement by SAIS to do those points, what is the management team at the school and the governing body to do, doing to improve uh, the skill level of, of the teachers? So I think a big issue is budgeting for staff developing, staff development in a school. But the mindset change is difficult. People are not going to change if someone doesn't force them to change. And sadly, this is, this is the case. What you've done and your uh, governing body said, someone said, okay, well, we're going to do it this way. We're not going to have one person on email, two people on a file and someone else getting a recording. There was a line in the sand and they said, okay, guys, this is the way we are doing it now. It's going to be difficult for the first year. We're going to adapt. We're going to grow. We're going to get new skills, but we're going to create a new normal because the old normal was reams of paper and, and that kind of thing. Now, communication is sorted and paper is sorted, not just paper. Uh, so there's, there's got to be a drive, a vision. If I go back to my slide, which I'm going to try and do, you'll see that um, I have put the two cornerstones. I don't know if you can see that. The two cornerstones of how our whole process, there's the four areas to address, but the two pillars on which they are based. One is leadership and one is professional development. Leadership comes from the SGB and the school management team. The principal has got to be brought into this. <laughs> the deputies have got to be brought into this. We've got to manage people. If someone constantly comes late for work, we can't say, oh, but they used to do it, so they're going to always do that. If it's outside of the scope of the job, we train them, we teach them. So, so I think it's a very difficult thing. I don't know if you're resonating with me, Paul, but you can't, well, let, you can't let people, the mindset of people become your vision. You've got to have a vision and their mindset fits into it. So Francois, maybe that's, that's a little bit too. Paul? Yeah, and I think that also types in with Megan. I hope you don't mind me mentioning that, Megan or Megan. Um, yeah, she, her comment was tough when your leadership does not share your vision and passion. Yeah, maybe I must, I must paint that picture. I'm sure we've, we've seen that video about leadership and I use it in a number of different scenarios about the, the youngster on the bank of the, the stadium or the bank of the sports field and he starts this strange, funny dance. Um, I don't have the video here and the copies that I've got are so grainy that it's not worth sharing, but he basically starts this dance. He's got this vision. He's got this idea. Um, and, and nothing is happening until someone actually follows him. Once someone follows him, then he's actually got, then he's a leader. He's not a leader before that. Yeah. I said it to a friend of mine on the bike though, that if you turn left and I turn right, you're no longer the leader. We've gone in the other direction. Um, but I think that's, yeah, to yeah. Answer, answer your comments or to comment on your comment, Megan, it is tough when your leadership does not share that vision. But that leadership is not always the designated leader. I'm not trying to make rebellion people, rebellious people here. But sometimes we've got to say, hang on a sec, that leadership doesn't come from the designated leadership. It comes from around us. And it, it, is, it is frustrating at times because you can see what can be done. My, my, my approach to it is step by step, puts it in place. Um, another school had a fantastic example that they, they shared with me. And I said, I'm going to share it with people. Is that they've been battling to get into technology. And over the years, I've had the same old debates that a lot of schools have, change of school uniform, how are we going to change this? Are we going to go to gray socks or black socks or brown socks or whatever it is? And the discussion came up the other day and someone rolled their eyes and said, oh, we've had that discussion again and we, don't, we know the answer is not conclusive. I said, well, and then they came back to me and said, they're so frustrated as governors. You know, this is not happening. I said, put a survey out. Oh, no, that will take a lot of paperwork. I said, put a Google form out. The learners will respond. The parents who want to respond will respond. And then you already start using that technology. So you're not bracketing it into technology and say, no harm on technology do. No harm on the tech center and on tech. Mm -hmm. You're actually living it. You're actually using it as you go along. 
And before you know it, it becomes part and parcel of how you're operating. So maybe, Megan, yeah, I yeah. understand it is tough when, when the leadership doesn't get involved and, you know, um, and don't get involved in the right direction, and it can be frustrating. But once you get one or two followers, that, that movement becomes a leadership thing and it, becomes, it, it starts happening there. So, so yeah. first bait there, Megan. Megan, don't, don't hold back. Um, keep pushing it. Keep making it happen for what? I want to quickly add to that, um, just what you're saying is very important. I just typed the answer in, in, in Megan's question box there. It's very important to understand that everyone is a leader. And 360 leadership means that you might not be the leader of the whole vision, but you have influence to lead upwards, downwards, and sideways. So two guys are cycling, both are the leader, until one of them turns this way and the other turns that way. And then the group follows who the new leader is. <laughs> So, so, so you peers, there's peer leadership, there's upward leadership, and there's downward leadership. So that's the 360, 360 picture of leadership. And one can lead very successfully upwards by showing new progressive thinking because the goal of school is not to stay the same, but to educate. And if, if lack of education is taking place because we're more staying the same, we're not vision-based. And that's where parents, I go to many bras with parents, and half of them say, oh, I visited the open day of that other neighboring school or that new um, private school. Do you know that they've got Lego robotics in third period? And I say, guys, we're the parents of the school. We can have it. So younger parents, new generation parents are saying, I'm paying a lot of money for extra murals, but why should my kid not be doing some of these extra murals at school, not at the local uh, business that does coding and robotics and other things. So the parent body has a voice. The teacher body has a voice. It's not just the principal. So, so leadership is a big thing, and that's why it's one of the most important elements that we identified in our plan to roll out technologies. What, what are the areas we've got to focus on? So that's unscrambling the egg, and then getting the cook, which is the leadership, and then getting the team, which is the teachers. Most educators are digitally literate, but not fluent. That's our biggest um, uh, piece of research uh, results is schools don't not do technology mainly because of budget. They don't do technology mainly because of teacher adoption rate. Um, so start those four E's that I have there for the first year, just Elevate your teachers, educators with new tech. Make them tech savvy. Like they use WhatsApp, they should be using Google, Wikipedia, Khan Academy, Google Apps for Education, Microsoft Office, collaborating on the same documents, emailing stuff to each other, not sending lists, class lists uh, on their SAM system rather than on you know, a printed out uh, paper copy of the class lists. Uh, you know, doing their formulas for their for their worksheets in Excel or whatever space they use, but being more tech savvy, just tech people, and then increasing tech in your space. I'm sitting in my house with 20, gig, 20 meg up and down fiber. Uh, I don't need to go anywhere if I can have a meeting like this. Paul and I meet two, three times a week without traveling. That's the new world we're living in. So, okay, more questions. I don't know if there's anything new there. There's just a question that's popped up from Francois. What do you suggest? Where do you suggest one starts the process of moving over to the new classroom of the future? I think what Rian said, while I'm letting Rian think about it, I think to me it's, it's a step at a time and it's starting the processes. I suppose it also that does depend on where your school sits, what your space is, what your management style is. Megan spoke about maybe not everybody's on board. It depends where you sit. If everybody's on board, it's easy. You budget for it, the budget next next term, you put it in place, you start rolling, bang, wow, off you go. Um, but maybe not everybody's there. Maybe it's got to start with a Google form survey of your learners first to find out if you're going to wear brown or black shoes, um, something minor like that. So it really does depend on your situation, I think, Francois. And I think the big thing is actually to get hold of Rian. And, and Rian will be able to guide you through where you are at the moment, because we're all on this digital path. We might not think we are. I think Rian's told us we are there now already, but we're just at different places. And it's really a case of saying, well, where are we and where, where can we go? What with, the, with the, 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 the background around us, the environment around us, where can we go and how fast can we go there? Um, bit of an answer, but maybe Rian, if you'll handle the rest of it. Yep. 
For sure. The um, quick question, I think it's a very relevant one because I ended my, my talk with how to get more practical. Um, it sounds like it's very easy to just say, let's do four things on four E's. Get our educators more tech savvy, get our spaces more tech savvy, then work on the behavior of our educators and then work on new knowledge. Those are the four E's um, that, that I showed. Uh, but where to start is go and evaluate where you are. Uh, I think a lot of schools don't know what they don't know about their tech infrastructure. I was at a school last week, Monday. I asked them, how's your internet connection? No, it's fast. So how fast? Very fast. Very fast is how long is a piece of string? <laughs> it, is not, it is not defined. So they don't know if they've got 4 meg, 10 meg, 20 meg, 100 meg, or a gig line, but it's fast. But if one person uses it, it's fast. But if 10 uses it, 10 use it, it's not fast. So, so understanding your landscape, go do stock take of your infrastructure, then go do stock take of your educator skills, and then go dream about what you want for your school, because it's not a one-year thing. Because if you want the classroom of the future, to reference Francois's question, what, where do I start to get to the classroom of the future? You've got to define the classroom of the future first. And that might be without technology, without screens. It might be completely different. So you've got to go and define what the end result is. And that's probably a five-year, a seven-year, or a ten-year picture for which you've got to do the development and, and input work now. So I think the question is, where do you start? By understanding that you've got to start. And you've got to get an ICT subcommittee. You've got to think of what the future looks like so that we can talk about it, debate it, survey it, and then start implementing. But to go out and just budget, okay, let's just get projectors for all classes and we sort it. That's, that's not a start. That's um, kind of just uh, yeah, uh, rubbing, rubbing the itch, but not really understanding the itch. Oh, that's okay. great. Thanks, thanks very much, Rian, for answering those questions and for handling them. I know time is of essence and we say four o'clock, so we're sitting on four o'clock. Um, I'll ask Rian just to keep an eye on any other questions that pop in while I just go through where we are. Um, upcoming webinars, third term is blank at the moment and I'm betting, I'm not betting, I'm working hard on getting the third term um, webinars together. Please pass a message around. We will be running more of these processes. They've really worked well for us. Um, on Splendid Altuya Talak works. Uh, it's also equally blank in the third term for Afrikaans at the moment, um, but I'm busy working on this week and we're going to have our new schedules coming out from there. Um, and then please go to the D6 Connect process, either on the Google um, Play Store or on the App Store. Look for D6 Connect and link up to FEDSAS. Um, that's where our information is going through to our members. Um, we're driving hard to get more people on board. New technology, not that new technology, technology out there. Getting information to you, that's what it's about. We don't just want to dump stuff. It's specific information that's really valuable from there. So get connected into that process as well. That would really be great so you can keep up to speed with where we're going. We're involved in all the social media platforms, TGIF, all those ones as well. So please go have a look at those. Get involved in those processes and find out where we are. There's our provincial managers. In case you haven't got the details of the provincial managers, please get hold of them as well. They are available, they are on call. Um, we have got sharp turnaround times if we get back to schools with whatever it might be. Please in particular get hold of Rian with regards to technology development. Um, Rian doesn't like being called the technology manager of FEDSAS because everybody should be the technology manager, but he's got to have a title somewhere. So, um, But please yeah, get hold of Rian or get hold of any other provincial managers and say, hey, we've got a, a thought process here. How do we go about it from that side? I think as time goes along, Obviously, ourselves, we're driving into technology and using it more and more as well. So please get hold of those folks or get hold of Rian. Um, or you're welcome to get hold of me. You've got a link that's come through. If you can't get anywhere else, just drop me a note and we can handle it from there. And then lastly, I'll just hand back to Rian just to say thank you very much. Um, and just to inform everybody that today is the first day that we've gone live on Facebook as well. Um, so we're running live on Facebook. We're seeing how it's working. Um, we'll see what the response is. I don't want to make people panic too much about it because we might not have had communication. But let's see how it goes to try and get this message out there a bit more. And then I'll just hand over to Rian. Thanks very much, Rian, for your involvement. Yeah. Brilliant. No, thanks for the audience. Thanks for you uh, uh, for, for, for the support. There. Yeah, I think last comment, just we, we, we're just stirring conversation. And I think that's important to, to get that advice. Let's keep talking about this. The second one is, 
go to Fetsas Tech, F E D S A S T E C H dot org dot za. That's the Center for Technology website, and we've got some information there and some of our corporate members. Uh, and please contact me if you want to take the discussion further about issues at your uh, school individually. Uh, and then, yeah, let's uh, continue the the discussion. So thanks, thanks to everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thanks very much. Cheerio. Bye.